May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to be with you this um, morning, church, at least virtually uh, in this way. Uh, We can't be together in person. I miss having you here in the sanctuary with us, but um, I'm glad to be connecting uh, online uh, today. And uh, the title of my sermon uh, for this morning here on Martin Luther King Jr. Day weekend uh, is why everyone hated Martin Luther King Jr. and why you probably uh, should too. And yes, you did hear that correctly. The sermon for this morning is called Why Everyone Hated Martin Luther King Jr. and Why You Probably uh, Should Too. The theologian Gerhard Abeling once said that one of the chief aims of Christian preaching is to make the Christian faith as hard as it needs to be. And so to put a slightly different spin on it this morning, one of my goals for the sermon is to make Martin King's faith as hard as it needs to be. Our King's message was a difficult one, one that was challenging to everyone who heard it, no matter their class, their race, or their creed. And we've somehow forgotten that. And so my goal for this morning is to make King's message as difficult as it should be once again. Now, just to be clear, before I preach a sermon entitled, Why Everyone Hated Martin King, uh, I actually love uh, Martin King, have read almost every word he ever wrote or said, and have an icon of his visage in my prayer chapel at home. And if you're like most people, you probably think that you love Martin King, too. Uh, In fact, in a recent Gallup poll of the most admired people of the 20th century, Martin King finished a second only to Mother Teresa, and there was a substantial gap between the two of them and all the other contenders. Most people, in other words, think that they love Martin King. But the irony of this is that at the time of his death, Martin King was one of the most unpopular people in the world. In 1967, he was called the most hated man in America, and his disapproval rating was 75 percent. To put that in perspective, President Trump's disapproval rating after the mob violence last year at the U.S. Capitol, which was not only the lowest in his presidency, but the lowest of any president in history, was only 62 percent. And worse still, lest we think his disapproval rating was merely a result of racism, Martin King's disapproval rating amongst the Black community at the time of his death was 54%. That was his disapproval rating. Now think about that for just a second. The Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964. Martin King was assassinated in 1968, yet somehow in that short time, more than half of Black America had turned against him. This is just a taste of what I mean when I say that everyone, that everyone hated Martin King. Now, why do I say all that at the outset of Martin Luther King Jr. Day weekend? Well, what happens so often with figures who have come to have the sort of transcendent popularity that Martin King now has, who we lionize with street signs or with national holidays, is that people who want to capitalize on their popularity tend to start reinventing them in their own image. Uh, One of the best examples I've ever seen of this took place in a 2018 Super Bowl ad for, believe it or not, Dodge Ram trucks. And I want to play the clip of that ad for you uh, here this morning. So give me just a sec to turn to that. Uh, Hang on just one second. Oops, that's the wrong one, sorry. Mm. 
If you want to be important, wonderful. If you want to be recognized, wonderful. If you want to be great, wonderful. But recognize that he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. That's a new definition of greatness. By giving that definition of greatness, it means that everybody can be great. You don't have to know about Plato and Aristotle to serve. You don't have to know the theory of relativity to serve. You don't have to know the second theory of thermodynamics in physics to serve. You only need a heart full of grace. Soul generated by love. Now, by show of hands here, does anybody remember that commercial from 2018? <laughs> yeah, it was the worst commercial of all time, in part because if you know anything about the speech that was being overlaid on top of those images of Dodge Ram trucks, the actual meaning, the message of that speech, which was called the drum major instinct, is the exact opposite of what's being portrayed in uh, that commercial. Let me just uh, show you what I mean by actually playing that same speech, a different portion of that same speech overlaid over the same images you just saw. Uh, the presence of this instinct explains why we are so often taken by advertisers. You know, uh, those gentlemen of massive verbal persuasion, and they have a way of saying things to you that kind of gets you in the bind. In order to be a man of distinction, you must drink this whiskey. In order to make your neighbors envious, you must drive this type of car. In order to be lovely to love, you must wear this kind of uh, lipstick or this kind of perfume. And you know, before you know it, you're just buying that stuff. And I've got to drive this car because it's something about this car that makes my car a little better than my neighbor's car. And I am sad to say that the nation in which we live is the supreme culprit. And I'm going to continue to say it to America. Yeah. Okay. So the irony there, I think, should be palpable, but what we find is that over and over again, right, what we've seen is that people pick and choose from among the things that Martin King has said in order to create a version of him who will serve to subsidize their own agendas. Meanwhile, the real Martin King, the Martin King who was a challenge to everybody, the Martin King who remains a challenge for us today gets left behind. Martin King had a hard word for everyone. He was perhaps hardest on what he called moderates, who he said in his letter from the Birmingham jail were a greater obstacle to black freedom than the KKK. And he was an outspoken opponent of what he called in the I Have a Dream speech, the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Make no mistake, Martin King preferred social revolution to social evolution. Though he was a pacifist, he was by no means passive. I am not sad that Black Americans are rebelling, he wrote in A Testament of Hope. This was not only inevitable, but eminently desirable. Without this magnificent ferment among Negroes, the old evasions and procrastinations would have continued indefinitely. And black men have slammed the door shut on a past of deadening passivity. These are our bright years of emergence. And though they are painful, they cannot be avoided. Against moderates, King time and time again said, no, now is the time, as he refused compromise and middle ground solutions. 
At the same time, King was also heavily critical of what he called the liberals, both in the political sphere and even more so in the church. In the political sphere, King echoed Malcolm X's sentiment that he preferred Goldwater to Johnson, calling the former a wolf and the latter a fox, just as dangerous, but even more deceptive. Now, Malcolm X also once said that liberalism in America means let's keep the Negroes in their place, but tell them we'll treat them a little better. Let's fool them more with more promises. And King seems to have agreed. In fact, King himself once said that he saw no difference between Nixon and Kennedy, which is a remarkable thing if you think about it in today's context. And for the church, King wrote a series of essays called The Weaknesses of Liberal Theology, which he denounced for not taking the Bible seriously enough and for failing to acknowledge the deep sinfulness of the human condition. King felt that white liberals had the privilege of being sanguine about human nature in a way that black people could not be having lived through centuries under the oppressive thumb of slavery and mob violence and lynching and Jim Crow and so forth. He also criticized liberal theology for holding to ideas of love that were so high in the sky that they never got to the practical work of creating real change on the ground. King called white liberals concern for black people a quote, sentimental affection, little more than what one would have for a pet and accused it of being meaningless unless concretized into direct action. You could again almost imagine him saying to us today, St. Mark's Church, you say you're one of the most progressive churches and one of the most progressive denominations in the country. Well, don't just tell me, show me. Show me by going out into the neighborhoods and mobilizing for change through concrete action. Because if all your progressivism means is that you listen to the right podcast or you have the right signs hanging in the East Yard or you put the right flags on your gate in the month of October, it doesn't mean anything. And you might as well be making America great again. I truly believe that King would have said that. Now, King's conflicts with conservatives throughout his life were, of course, more visible, but they actually accelerated toward the end of his life, especially through his opposition to the war in Vietnam. We don't tend to focus on this, but in the last years of his life, King turned much of his attention away from battling racism per se and placing racism aside two other great concerns, capitalism and militarism. For King, these evils, as he called them, of capitalism and militarism were equal to and intricately interconnected with the evil of racism, which led many conservatives to believe that he was a communist ally of North Vietnam. In one of the final sermons of his life, King said that America was, quote, going to go to hell for its attitudes toward wealth and poverty and called for a, quote, radical redistribution of economic and political power. So if there's any question where Martin King would have stood on the questions of reparations, then there's your answer. And beyond Vietnam, he argued that America was, quote, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world, and also referred to American militarism as a, quote, demonic, destructive suction tube. It was sucking the life out of the people, not only in our country, but people throughout the world. Now, it should be noted that it was also in shifting his focus toward critiquing capitalism and militarism that he lost much of the Black community too, either because they felt he had forgotten his cause or even more fundamentally because they disagreed that capitalism and militarism were interconnected with racism. But, and this is where King's message may be most challenging still today, King could not separate racism and capitalism and militarism for one basic reason. And that reason 
was Jesus. The king's logic here actually has two parts. First, he saw the interconnection between these evils in terms of Genesis 3, 5. Ye shall be like gods. In other words, King believed that the ground floor of human evil was the pursuit of a godlike power exercised through attempts to control, master, and dominate other people. For King, whether the means of exercising that power was a military arsenal or transnational markets or racist ideology, the heart of the problem was the same. The attempt to make gods of ourselves by, pick, by taking power over others for our own ends. And so second, and because of this, King felt that the only resolution of these evils, the only resolution to these evils was the humility, vulnerability, and weakness of Jesus, especially as displayed in the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, greater attention has been brought in recent years to the fact that toward the end of his life, King was becoming increasingly radicalized. Martin was moving ever closer to Malcolm, as James Cone put it. And that's 100% true. But, and this was another way in which he lost some of the Black community by the end of his life, Martin never wavered in his fundamental commitment to the path of Christian nonviolence typified by what he said was the very center of Jesus's teaching. The love, the love of our enemies. You know, if you want an easy strategy for getting everyone to hate you, just tell them to love their enemies. It worked for Jesus as well as it did for Martin. But for Martin, nonviolence and the love of enemies was not pious and idealistic, but practical and strategic. For him, there was an obvious and straightforward and common sense logic to it. Violence is a descending spiral, he argued, begetting the very thing that it seeks to destroy. Instead of diminishing evil, it multiplies it. So it goes. Returning violence for violence multiplies violence, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love, only love can do that. You cannot put out fire with fire, as the old saying goes. And so for Martin, the only weapon that will prevail against the power, domination, and control at the heart of human evil is the weakness, fragility, and vulnerability of Christ's cross. As he writes, we must not return violence under any condition. This is the way of Christ. This is the way of the cross. We must somehow believe that unearned suffering is redemptive, that the believer in nonviolence lives by the conviction that through this suffering and cross-bearing, the social situation will be redeemed. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that teaching really, really hard. And frankly, I still have my questions uh, for Martin. But I pray, I pray that as we consider his words again this morning, that challenge might come to us in fresh ways, even and as much as we might hate him for it. Amen.